Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am the proud son of a World War II Navy man, Otto C. Schwarz, and I'm currently executive director of the Survivors Association of the Men of That Ship. Today, we'll see a story about a segment of World War II occurring in the West Asia Pacific Theater. It'll be a story about one particular ship, USS Houston CA-30, as seen through the eyes of one of its shipmates, my late dad, Otto C. Schwarz, and reflecting the experiences of his shipmates. It's also a story about the greatest generation, those associated with having lived through both the Great Depression and World War II. Now, many of you have seen the 1957 epic movie Bridge on the River Kwai and one of its main stars, William Holden, who was depicted as an officer off of the USS Houston C-830. Today, you will hear the real story version from a man who survived both the sinking of that ship on March 1st, 1942, and served the remainder of World War II as a POW, including a 13-month stint used as a slave laborer, assisting in the building of the Death Railway, also depicted in the movie. Ten thousand ton heavy attack cruiser, and it had um, three eight-inch uh, gun turrets, each having three barrels, uh, two forward of the foremast and one aft of the mainmast. We also had um, eight five-inch twenty-five caliber anti-aircraft uh, guns and uh, one point one uh, pom poms and then 50 and 30 caliber machine guns. As you can see, it was a, quite a beautiful ship. Uh, it also had another distinction, uh, uh, as well as being the flagship of the Asiatic fleet, it was also President Roosevelt's favorite ship. He made four world cruises aboard the Houston, and among its many nicknames over the years, one was, uh, the, it was called the President's Ship. Now, uh, as flagship of the Asiatic fleet, we were home ported in Manila in the Philippine Islands. Uh, about a week before Pearl Harbor, uh, as a matter of fact, on December the 1st, we were given orders to leave Manila and to proceed to the southern islands of the Philippines. We left Manila and we went south to the island of Panay to the harbor at Iloilo, and there we began preparing for the attack, which uh, apparently everyone knew was coming. We welded down our portholes, we uh, secured everything that would fly around in, in battle, and we manned our guns and we prepared for war. Uh, the same day that Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were leaving the harbor at Iloilo, and the Japanese came and bombed, uh, um, but fortunately we were in the shadows of the mountainside, and we managed to uh, get away without any uh, problem. The Japanese did, however, report to the world that they had sunk the USS Houston that day. As a matter of fact, they reported uh, that they had sunk the Houston so many times after that that we became known as the galloping ghost of the Java coast. We left the Philippines and proceeded south through the South China Sea down to a place called Surabaya, uh, Java, which is a big seaport on the eastern uh, side of Java. And for the next several months, we primarily did convoy work between Surabaya and Darwin, Australia, which is about 1,200 miles to the south. And at that time, they were attempting to reinforce and, and build up Australia and Java uh, for the attack that they knew was coming. On February the 4th of 1942, we were uh, heading for um, an attack on the Japanese that had been sighted in Macassar Straits, and we got into the Flory Sea just north of uh, Surabaya, and we were attacked by a large number of Japanese planes, uh, numbering uh, something like 54. Uh, we had a, um, a, long, uh, a very 
arduous sea air attack from the Japanese uh, at the outcome uh, the Marblehead, the light cruiser that was accompanying us, had been hit in her steering and, her, and she was out of commission completely. And the, we were hit by one 500-pound bomb, which totally destroyed our after 8-inch uh, gun turret, killing all 48 men in the turret and leaving uh, the turret totally useless from then on. Um, after that, we went back down to um, uh, Darwin, Australia on February the 10th, and we uh, attempted to take a convoy to the island of Timor to stop a Japanese landing there. And we got uh, several hundred miles outside of Darwin when we were spotted by Japanese planes, and we finally were attacked on the 16th of February by 36 Japanese planes. And in a, in a, a miraculous effort to save the convoy, Captain Rooks had our ship uh, do flank speed around the convoy, setting up a, uh, a wall of fire from our anti-aircraft guns and drawing all of the Japanese bombs onto us and um, therefore saving the convoy. Uh, this is what uh, it was described to us by the men on the ships that we were convoying, that all of the bombs had hit and, and the Houston totally disappeared under the water and they thought that we were gone. But however, we, we managed to drive the planes off and with no damage to the convoy, but we were ordered to return to Darwin uh, as uh, Timor had already been landed upon by the Japanese. This photograph it was taken after we had uh, seen the convoy of ships that you see in the background safely into the harbor at Darwin and the ship behind us is the four stack destroyer the USS Perry. Uh, we uh, left that same afternoon to head back up to Surabaya to join the fleet that was being um, put together uh, to try to stop the Japanese and um, the per we, Perry uh, got a sounding of a submarine and uh, she was sent to investigate and had to go back to Darwin for fuel. And the following morning, the Japanese came into Darwin in great numbers and bombed the, the harbor and all the installations of the town and, tow and sunk every ship uh, that you see in, in the photograph, including the Perry. In the meantime, we headed back north up to uh, Surabaya and there we joined a fleet that was being put together uh, of, uh, comprised of any ship that was in the area, whether it be British, Dutch, Australian, or American. And we were placed under the um, uh, command of a Dutch admiral. And uh, we knew that there were two large Japanese task force converging on Java, one coming down through the South China Sea uh, between Sumatra and Borneo, and the other coming down on the other side of Borneo through the Macassar Straits, both heading towards Java. And our job apparently was to attempt to stop them or at the very least to slow them down. Several days of um, uh, searching the Java Sea, we finally uh, were notified that the Japanese fleet had been sighted uh, at Bawian Island, just north of Surabaya. So we went out and um, uh, met the Japanese. Um, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because what ensued was a real massacre in that uh, we met this uh, very modern, well-equipped, well-trained Japanese Navy and all we had were a bunch of uh, uh, older ships uh, with uh, no common battle plans. We had never operated together before. The signals were difficult and the Japanese all during the, the battle uh, uh, had an aircraft flying overhead dropping flares, so we were, um, uh, our positions were constantly known by the Japanese, and in addition, all of her cruisers had long-range torpedoes, and we didn't. And um, after the end of a, of a very uh, severe eight-hour sea battle, uh, the Japanese had sunk 12 of our ships, and uh, we were ordered uh, to uh, leave the um, area uh, and to proceed to the western end of the island. But um, 
This is an artist's conception of the Java Sea battle. And um, we're, the only two ships that were left after the uh, eight-hour battle was the HMAS Perth, an Australian light cruiser, and the USS Houston. We were ordered to disengage the enemy and to proceed to the western end of the island of Java and uh, refuel and attempt to escape to Australia. Uh, we headed west and uh, went to the port city of Jakarta, uh, where uh, we found that the Dutch had already evacuated, and we got as much fuel as we possibly could. And then we left in, in the afternoon of, um, of February 28th, and we headed uh, westward towards uh, the little bay that, that's on the map at the northwestern tip of uh, Java. Well, there, when we approached the um, Bantam Bay, we ran right into the middle of a large Japanese task force. Uh, they have, were already uh, landing uh, troops on the island. As a matter of fact, there were 55 transports uh, degorging troops on the island. There were reportedly four cruisers, 13 destroyers, and an unknown number of torpedo boats. So the only thing that the Houston and the Perth could do would be to just go uh, flank speed, uh, guns uh, pointing port and starboard, right into the middle of them, uh, which is what we did. And uh, uh, just shortly after midnight, the Perth was struck by her fourth torpedo, and she went down. About 45 minutes later, the Houston, uh, uh, now carrying on alone, uh, was struck by her fourth torpedo, and she lay dead in the water, and the Japanese formed a semicircle around the ship, turned the searchlights on us, and just started blasting us with, uh, with hundreds and hundreds of shells. This is an artist's conception of the Houston's last moments um, in Sunda Straits just prior to uh, her going down. Uh, my battle station at that time was in number one turret, but I was in the powder magazines, which is as uh, far below the water as you can get. There were 13 of us down in the, in the magazine, and when the word came to abandon ship, we had to make our way up to the main deck, and then aft to the quarter deck, and then up on the forecastle uh, or forward part of the ship. And from there, we would get our life jackets and, and um, abandon ship. Uh, this uh, we started to do, and we got up to the main deck, and we started to go aft. And uh, shortly after turning aft, there was a large explosion. I don't know if it was a torpedo or a shell, but I was knocked unconscious. And when I came to, I was the only one left of the 13. I made my way back uh, and, and to the quarter deck, and then up to the forecastle. And where I was supposed to get my life jacket was on fire. It had been hit by a shell. And I couldn't get a life jacket, so we, uh, I milled around on the forecastle for a while, uh, uh, looking at these Japanese ships uh, just off our um, port side, uh, pounding us with these shells, and the searchlights were on us. Finally, I decided to get off the ship, and as I walked aft to get to a lower point to jump from, uh, someone walked up to me and said, uh, you don't have a life jacket. Uh, here, and he had one on and one in his hand, then he handed me a life jacket and I took it and I went back to that, uh, to the position where there was a boat boom uh, and I lowered myself on the boat boom and jumped into the water and just swam as fast and as frantically as I could to get away from the ship. Um, I was in the water about, oh, 13 hours or so, and well into the next afternoon, um, I hadn't um, met anybody during the night. I uh, hadn't seen a life raft or a lifeboat or anything. I was just swimming there all by myself the whole time. And finally, the next day in the, in the afternoon, a Japanese landing barge bringing supplies to the troops that had landed on the beach came along and stopped and picked me up and then brought me to the beach and turned me over to the Japanese forces on the beach. This is a picture of the first prison camp that I was in. Now, the Japanese had, did not know that they were going to capture hundreds of men from a sea battle. And um, having uh, uh, 
now several hundred men, as a matter of fact, about 600 men off of both ships, um, uh, they had to take care of some way, so they, they set up um, a system where they opened up the local jails on the western end of Java and let the prisoners out and put us in. And this was my first prison. It's in a town called Rangkaspidong on the western end of the island of Java. There were 19 of us eventually picked up on that section of beach where I was deposited. And, but before we got to this jail, we were to encounter our first taste of Japanese hospitality. And that was that the Japanese had brought with them uh, carts made out of iron piping uh, with uh, uh, rubber covered wheels and two shafts in the front. And it was intended that horses would pull these carts loaded with ammunition and supplies along with the troops as they advanced on the island. Unfortunately, uh, the ships uh, that had the horses on them were sunk in the battle the night before, and they needed horses. So each prisoner of war was uh, assigned to one cart. We were put into the shafts of the cart. Uh, a Japanese soldier with a rifle and bayonet was assigned to keep us moving. And for four days and four nights, we pulled these heavy carts of ammunition over a hot asphalt highway on the western end of Java in temperatures that must have reached uh, well over 100, 105, 110. We had no clothing, no hats, no shoes, and we were given no food or water, and we were constantly screamed at and beaten uh, to keep us going. Uh, I only can remember parts of it because a great deal of the time I kept uh, passing out and coming to with my Japanese guard beating me on the back. But after the end of four days, we uh, were taken to a little one-room schoolhouse, and uh, they put our feet up on the desk, and the Japanese soldier came along with a pair of tweezers and a bottle of iodine and ripped the soles of our feet, which had now become one big blister, ripped it off and poured iodine on it, and then we got up and marched again. This is the inside view of the jail. Um, I was in that middle cell um, for the first six weeks of my existence, and um, we thought that um, everything was pretty lousy. You know, we had a, a little wooden um, platform to sleep on, a little wooden bucket for a bathroom, and once a day we were handed a, um, a bucket of sloppy rice, and uh, uh, we were not happy campers. At the end of six weeks, however, they came uh, with a truck and took us 20 kilometers away to a place called Serang, which where we were to meet up with the bulk of the prisoners, uh, the survivors off the Houston and Perth. The Houston had a crew of 1,067, and 368 managed to get off alive and were captured. The Perth had a, a crew of uh, some, uh, uh, I don't know, six or 700, and she had about 300 survivors. So there were just uh, over 600 men that the Japanese had captured. Now, this is the um, Serang jail where uh, some of our men were kept. And this is the inside of that jail, and, and that well was their only source of water. And in the background, be below those, uh, the overhang, uh, were the cells where um, the Perth and Australian survivors were jammed in and, and kept for six weeks. Now, we went a little further on into town, and we went to this uh, uh, market square, and in the middle of the square was this uh, theater, and uh, in the theater, uh, they had about 600 of the survivors all jammed in on a cement floor. They had been packed in there like sardines. Most of them were wounded or sick uh, or from bunker oil or in some way incapacitated. But the Japanese gave them no medical attention at all. And when we got there six weeks later, we thanked God for the um, jail that he had uh, put us into because by far we were better off than these men were. And as a matter of fact, many of these men never survived the after effects of that first six weeks. Well, they put all of us then in trucks and they took us back to the city of Jakarta which is on the, on the western, northwestern tip of Java. And for the next several months, uh, we were in a large uh, former Dutch army camp. 
and we were uh, cleaning up the debris of the invasion, uh, working on the docks and things of that nature. And things were were not that bad. Uh, we worked hard. The food was 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 not good at all, and we got slapped around quite a bit. But but uh, we still had our health, and we were surviving quite well. Uh, Around the end of September, beginning of October of 1942, the Japanese started telling us that we were going on a trip, that we were going to be taken to a large mountain camp, and that we were going to be uh, allowed to do light duty work and be given good food so that we could maintain our health. Well, what happened was that they jammed thousands of us into the holes of little dirty inter-island steamships and we sat in these steel coffins for days in the tropical heat. Uh, we had no, no um, bathroom facilities. We were just packed down into these, into these steel holes. And once in a while, they would lower a bucket of uh, sloppy rice. And uh, it was just a, a miserable experience. These ships, which is the common way that prisoners were transported, have become known to historians as hell ships and uh, a very apt um, title indeed. Uh, we left uh, Jakarta finally and we, w we went four days up the South China Sea to Singapore. And at Singapore, we um, uh, managed to get a little bit of rest from the, uh, from the terrible journey. But after about 10 days, they put us back on another ship and we headed up the Andaman Sea, uh, up along the coast of Malaya, and to Rangoon, Burma. And from Rangoon, Burma, we went across to a place called Maulmain. And then we, we found out what it was the Japanese had in mind for us. Now, at that point in time, the Japanese were fighting the British on the, on the India-Burma border, and they were losing the campaign. And they were losing the campaign because in order to, to supply the troops uh, and to reinforce the troops, they had to come down from Japan thousands upon thousands of, of uh, sea miles all the way down the South China Sea, around Malaya, up to Rangoon, and then up to the front lines by rail. Uh, by June of 1942, the United States uh, submarines had that, uh, the sea lanes blocked and they could no longer uh, go along that route. Uh, they uncovered a, uh, drawings or plans for a railroad to be hooked up by the British prior to World War II. As you can see, there is a railroad system in Burma running north and south, and there was a railroad system running across French Indochina into Siam. But there was a, an area of about 250 miles uh, from a point just north of Bangkok up to Maulmain, Burma, that was not connected. And the, the, the British had given up the idea because they said it would be impossible to do because of the uh, totally inhospitable jungle and the uh, uh, unable to get modern equipment in and the tropical diseases, and they abandoned the idea. Japanese uh, felt, well, gee, we have all these prisoners and we need this railroad because then we can follow that shorter route and come down and, and um, bring our men and material to Bangkok and then by rail right up to the front lines. So that's what we were brought up there to do. They brought 61,000 Allied prisoners of war and uh, some of us went to the end that I described where we went up by Maulmain, Burma and started working uh, southwest, and the other group was taken to a point just above Bangkok, and they started working northeast. And uh, in addition to the 61,000 prisoners of war, they also uh, conscripted uh, something like, uh, well, over 200,000 native workers, Tamils, Thais, Indonesians, and, and forced them to go up on the railroad as slave labor to work alongside of the POWs. Uh, this um, a map will give you a better idea of the area that I'm talking about. You see the heavy black line uh, uh, going between uh, uh, a point outside of Bangkok up to a point just outside of Maulmain, Burma. That was the 250-mile stretch between uh, Burma and Siam uh, of totally inhospitable jungle, and that's what has now become known as the Burma-Siam Death Railway 
made uh, famous or infamous by the movie Bridge on the River Kwai. As you can see, the, the terrain in this particular photograph is uh, of solid rock, and without the aid of any modern equipment whatsoever, well, these cuts were made through the mountain just using uh, manpower, uh, using a, a, a rod with a, a tip on the end of it and a hammer, and um, a, a, a tap and turn, and uh, a stick of dynamite would be put into the hole and, and the rock would, would be blown away. Uh, this is another cut also uh, through solid rock. When we first arrived in Burma, we were assembled uh, by Colonel Nagatomo, who was the, in charge of the Burma end of the railroad, and he made a speech uh, during which he told us that we were the rabble of the lost army, that we had no rights, and that the uh, Japanese were crying to have let us live, and uh, we should have committed Harry Carey like any uh, a good Japanese soldier would have done, and. Uh, but they need this railroad for their war effort, and they intend to build it over the bodies of the, of the white man. And then he ended his speech by saying, be happy in your work. Uh, the, this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of 43 bridges that was along the 250-mile track, uh, hugging the mountainside in Thailand, and on your left-hand side is a, a river which during the monsoon season became so swollen uh, that the water was above the, the track on the railroad where the men were working. Uh, now these are the fit men uh, in uh, a hut. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're down to uh, pro probably uh, 90 pounds or so. Uh, when we first went to Burma, it wasn't too bad, but uh, shortly uh, we started to suffer from malnutrition and starvation and our body weight started to drop rapidly and our uh, susceptibility to diseases uh, was very high and so therefore the death rate also started to rise. And within about five months, everybody weighed about 85 or 90 pounds and everyone was uh, inflicted with uh, malaria, beriberi, dysentery, pellagra, cholera or some or a combination of uh, tropical diseases. Uh, the work of course slowed down because the men were getting sick and dying and the Japanese became more and more sadistic and pushed us further and further and started beating us more and more. This is another one of the bridges uh, along the expanse. This is all teak wood from the jungle and when we first went there we had elephants working with us to, to drag the logs down to the site but shortly um, uh, after they started to treat the elephants like they did the prisoners and they started to starve and die and, and uh, they, those that were left ran away and the Japanese said not to worry because ten uh, Americans are just as good as one elephant. This is a, another one of the bridges. This bridge was uh, fondly nicknamed the Deck of Cards because it fell down three times during construction before they finally got it to stand up. Uh, a great many lives were lost building these bridges because as uh, the men were sicker and sicker and the death rate got higher and higher, uh, the work slowed down and the Japanese were getting frantic because their engineers had given them, uh, or at least Imperial headquarters had given them 18 months in which to build the railroad. Um, despite the fact that their engineers had said it would take five to seven years. So they started to, as I said before, become more and more cruel. And as the monsoons came and the water would rise up uh, on this bridge work, they would be hitting men and, and knocking them into the water and they would disappear. This is, uh, again, a bridge hugging the um, stone cliff uh, along the river uh, in Thailand. Now, this is um, a bridge that uh, I had worked on myself. This photograph was taken by an Australian who had secreted a camera into the camp and actually took the picture and was able to hide it until it was uh, developed after the war. Um, the, this photograph shows what happened very quickly to the railroad as it was being built. The Allies came over and bombed all the bridges and um, the, the Japanese became more and more frantic and we were uh, uh, beaten and kept uh, build, rebuilding the bridges and then the planes would come over and knock them down again. Um, the slide demonstrates very clearly how thick 
the jungle was uh, where we were. There were no villages, no, no inhabitants. There were just uh, wildlife like tigers and pythons and monkeys. Uh, this is a, a view of one of the camps. They all looked alike. They were all constructed alike. The huts were made out of uh, bamboo framework. Uh, bamboo was the magic building material. We used it for everything. We used it to make our, our housing. We made it. We made our mess kits out of it and our water bottles. And then eventually even uh, artificial limbs for amputees. This is a, a, a view of uh, one of the camps. Uh, the huts were about 250 kilometers long. And um, down each side of the openings was a um, platform built uh, and each man was given 36 inches, and that was all that he had to live on uh, during the few hours that he did get in from the railroad. Um, this will give you a closer view of the uh, opening on the, on the sides of the, with the ends of the huts. Down on each side of that opening was a bamboo platform about three feet high, and each man, as I said, had 36 inches uh, to lay down on, and uh, that was all you got. And there was no bedding supplied, we had no clothing, and we were laying on the rough, uh, jagged pieces of, of bamboo and the bamboo was also filled with uh, bed bugs and lice which added to our misery. Now this is a view in one of the camps and the monsoon season which used to last for five months uh, uh, during the year uh, and when wherein it would rain seven days a week 24 hours a day and everything was mud and water and we we slept in mud and we worked in mud and we sat down and ate in mud and uh, in this photograph uh, the monsoon has apparently ceased and the, the mud is starting to turn back into dirt. Uh, now as uh, time went on and, and, and we started to suffer more and more from malnutrition and starvation, the men started to lose more and more body weight. And here's a photograph of some of the men on the railroad. And as you can see, they're, they're hardly fit to stand and, and uh, erect without having to work. 13, 14, 15 hours a day being beaten and screamed at and, and uh, hollered at. Um, this is another picture of the three uh, of the men uh, on the railroad. Um, this uh, chap in the middle uh, was 22 years old when this picture was taken. Um, shortly after the photograph was taken, two of the three of them uh, uh, passed away. Um, this is a picture that was taken very early on and, uh, but I use it to, to demonstrate uh, the type of clothing that we wore. Uh, the Japanese issued us no clothing at all, and the only thing that we had was a piece of cotton cloth about three feet long with pieces of string tied to it, and you tied the string around your waist, and then you, you took the cotton cloth up between your legs and tucked it in the string. That's the only thing that we had. We had no shoes, we had no uh, hats or shirts or anything to uh, shield us from the tropical sun. Uh, this is an inside of a camp to give you an idea what it might have looked like uh, in, in the early days before things really got rough and uh, the men, uh, this is a British army hut and uh, you see quite a bit of clothing hanging from, from the rafters. If, if you had gone into the American and Australian sailors hut you wouldn't find that because we came ashore with nothing and the Japanese gave us nothing so we always had nothing. Now, uh, this, in addition to all of those diseases that I described before, the malaria, very, very dysentery, pellagra, etc. The thing that we feared the most was tropical ulcers. And uh, here is a, 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 a two such tropical ulcers. Uh, you scratch yourself uh, and becomes festered. And then within two or three days, uh, it starts to eat away the flesh and the muscle. And, and eventually, it's, it's all the way down to the bone and it's turned septic. And blood poisoning is setting in. And, and the men were dying in very uh, great numbers due to tropical ulcers. Now the doctors uh, realized that uh, they had to try to do something to save some of the men with the tropical ulcers. Uh, the normal uh, treatment uh, used by the Dutch doctors was to sharpen an army spoon and hold the man down and dig all of the, the uh, rotten flesh out. Uh, uh, these are four men or five men who uh, have had amputations and this picture was taken at the end of the war when they were brought down to Singapore out of the jungle. And as you can see, they've, uh, they've 
they've been in Singapore quite a while, so they've uh, gotten back a lot of their strength. And you can see the different types of prosthesis that they ended up with down there. There's an aluminum one and a, and a, a leather one. Uh, up in the jungle, they would have all had the uh, legs made out of bamboo. Now, when the railroad was finished, they started taking the survivors out of the jungle in these steel rice cars. Now, uh, the English had given up the idea and said it couldn't be done. The um, a Japanese engineer said it would, could be done, it would take five to seven years, and Imperial headquarters gave them 15 months to do it, or 18 months, rather. Uh, while the railroad was finished, actually in 15 months, but what a price to pay to build a 250-mile stretch of railroad. Uh, of the 61,000 Allied prisoners of war, at the end of the 15 months, 16,000 were laying in shallow graves alongside of the track in the jungle. And of the over 200,000 natives that were conscripted to work with us, uh, uh, less than 30,000 uh, were accounted for. Well, when war ended, or when the railroad was finished in December of 1943, we were packed into these cars, uh, 40, 50 men to a car, and we were taken out of the jungle down to a large camp near the bridge on the River Kwai. Now, this is a a picture of the actual beginning of the construction of the bridge on the River Kwai. It was built by British, Dutch, and Australian prisoners of war. There were no Americans uh, in on the initial building of the bridge. We were 150 miles further up in the jungle in Burma working towards this site. Uh, and we came to this place uh, when the railroad was finished and we came across the finished bridge. That's what the bridge looked like after it was finished. It was a steel bridge and you can see in the background the mountains that were, uh, are separating Burma and Thailand and uh, as I said before we were working perhaps 150 miles beyond that working towards this site. Now the uh, bridge on the River Kwai was not destroyed as Hollywood depicted it by uh, William Holden and Alec Guinness fighting over a plunger and dynamiting the bridge. It was actually destroyed by British and American B-24 raids out of India. And this is a photograph taken from one of the planes the day that the bridge was hit. The prison camp is just behind the bridge uh, in that clump of trees. Um, this aerial shot shows um, after the center spans had been struck. And if you look down to the lower left, you can see the huts of the camp. And just slightly to the right of that, between the two uh, railroad lines, was an anti-aircraft battery, which the Japanese used to tell us they put there to protect us. Now, this is what the bridge on the River Kwai looked like after the bombing raids. They knocked down two of the center steel spans. Now. Um, after the railroad was finished, they started, as I said, bringing the survivors out of the jungle, and from that point on, they started dispersing us to other places. Some men went back down to Singapore and Changi prison, and other men uh, were destined to go to Japan, uh, and I was in that group, and we left uh, uh, the bridge on the River Kwai, went down to Bangkok, Thailand, and across Cambodia to Nam Pin, and then from Nam Pin we went down by uh, large barges uh, down to Saigon, uh, only to find that the ships that we were to take to uh, Japan could not get out because of American submarines, and we remained in French Indochina or Vietnam, uh, as it's now known, for the rest of the war. Now, the Japanese were very proud of the railroad. They had done something that the British said could not be done, and they had, um, they had done something that their engineers said would take five to seven years, and they had done it in 13 months. So they decided to build a monument to, the, to this great feat and to the memory of the men involved. This photograph was taken the day that the monument was uh, dedicated, and that uh, American soldier that you see standing sideways is a fellow named Lieutenant Fillmore from the 131st Field Artillery, and when he saw the cameraman, he stepped back and sideways, hoping that the picture would get out to the free world and they would know that there were Americans there and some of us were still alive. Now, this is a close-up of the monument. It has become a very 
favorite tourist attraction for thousands upon thousands of Japanese who come there every year to see this marvelous engineering feat uh, performed by their, uh, their army engineers. Now, this is a bronze plaque that the Japanese have affixed to the monument, and it, essentially it says that the, uh, the monument was erected with the help of uh, allied uh, personnel and who died through illness during its construction. Quite ironic wording. Uh, of course, they don't tell the world um, how those people died, and they don't tell the world that they were starved and beaten and allowed to die without medical attention. After the war, the Japanese government sent down a team of uh, engineers, and they replaced the two center spans as part of their war reparations to the country of Siam. And this is a photograph of the bridge after it had been rebuilt by the engineers. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken during the um, progress of the reconstruction of the bridge. And uh, I suspect that this was the model for the uh, Kwai Bridge that was in the movie the Bridge on the River Kwai. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, there is a small section of the railroad still in daily use. You can take this commuter train uh, for a distance of about 10 kilometers beyond the river and all the way into Bangkok. Uh, beyond that point, the jungle has reclaimed the entire railroad and, and, and no signs of it exist at all. Isn't that a uh, peaceful uh, uh, Asiatic travel poster with the banana trees and the still waters of the river and the, the bridge. It's, it's um, hard to imagine to someone who doesn't know that uh, several hundred thousand people were killed building that bridge and that railroad in just 15 months.